Uh, my name's John Lakos. I work at Bloomberg, and I've presented this particular uh, talk at three previous conferences, ACCU, uh, C++ Now, and CPPCon. It's the first time I've ever presented the same talk the whole year around, and the reason for that is it's very important because this stuff, the stuff that you're going to see here, is part of C++ 17, and it's part of C++ 17 because of the work we did for this talk. So kind of, it's important, so it's relevant, so I pushed everything back, so my this year's talks are going to be given next year. You reuse, it's good. So welcome, I didn't expect this big a crowd because this is a fairly specialized topic, or at least people think it is. The people who think it's a specialized topic are wrong, of course, because it's very important for anybody who cares about performance. But anyway, I will get to it. It's very dense. Normally my talks are, you know, six, seven, eight hundred slides. This one's only about 500, but because of the animation, it's more like 5,000. <laughs> You've been warned. Here's the copyright notice. Here's the abstract. You're already here, so you don't need to read this because you're going to get the whole thing anyway. Picture taken. Okay. So, are memory allocators really worth the trouble? I obviously have an opinion. I suspect there are people who are here that don't agree yet that they're worth the trouble. I suspect there are people here that don't know why anybody would ever use a memory allocator because we already have one in C++, you know, new, delete, it's all good, right? Why do we need this? So you don't have to raise your hand and embarrass yourself, but internally think, what category are you in? I already love allocators, I'm here to learn how to use them. Unfortunately, if you're in that category, it's not the right talk. There are other talks that teach you exactly how to use them. Why to use them? When to use them? Yeah, this is a good talk. But exactly how? Not exactly. Because this is not about syntax, mostly. This is about why on earth would anybody ever want to do such a thing. Okay? So just want you to be clear. Now, if you want to heckle me, I love it. The trouble is I won't get through the talk if you heckle me too much in the beginning. So what I'm asking is, if you have a question for understanding purposes, raise your hand, we'll, we'll cover it. If you really want to... Yes? Okay, but given that, please raise your hand only if you think other people won't understand what I just said, because otherwise I will not get through the talk, and that would be a shame. Now, at the end, you can take me to task for the rest of the session, I mean everything, if I get through it. So I'm going to try to get through it and leave a little room at the end of the second talk. That's my goal. So with that said, here's the outline. I'm going to give a little introduction and background because everybody's not on the same page. I do not pretend to be an expert in concurrency or anything like that. Uh, I'm pretty good at memory allocators because I've been doing it for since my first book was published back in 1996. And so I have a good idea that they actually are useful. But most people don't agree and some people will come up with reasons why we don't need them and well, we'll see if they're right after this. So let's start with why do we like C++? Uh, well, it enables us to fine tune at a low level, right? That's why we like it. It's a powerful language. Uh, and it can deliver high, high runtime performance. That's another reason we use it. Why else would we use C++ and not a more human-friendly language but for performance and saving power, right? Does anybody have another reason to use C++? Because it's cool? Is that why we use it? Yes? You're going on record. Somebody take a picture of that man's face. You'll never get a job again. Okay. Why should we care about memory allocators? Well, it's no surprise, it helps us to fine tune and we can improve runtime performance. It's the same thing. All right, what are the benefits? Not all memory is alike. Would you agree that not all memory is alike? Has anybody ever heard of shared memory? Has anybody ever heard of cache memory? How about device IO mapped memory? Yeah, okay. Uh, testing could be useful, debugging. Measuring? Did you ever think that allocators, an interface for allocators, actually allow you to tune your system? What a thought. So all of these are other reasons why we would want to have allocators as part of our <coughs> API. And yet, only if you're in senior management do you care about these things. But we all care about performance, because that's why we like C++. But I promise you, this thing about measuring your boss's boss, if, if your boss's boss is technical, will care about this. All right. So enhanced runtime performance, better locality, less contention, that's what we're going to talk about mostly today. And then it
But I'll remind you, oh, by the way, that's just one aspect of why we want allocators. But I think if I sell you on the performance, you might just take the others for free. I wouldn't have to convince you, right? If you buy the performance. Yes? No? Maybe? Okay. All right, so this is not something that I just discovered last year. About 1997, I was working at Bear Stearns, and a fellow came up to me and said that, uh, you know, I have a problem. I'm building this model, and it takes about 10 seconds for the memory to go away once I destroy my object. This was in the uh, uh, equity derivatives, and they're building models for pricing and whatever. And so I decided to provide a memory allocator that allowed quick release. The reason that... Uh, it wasn't a big deal back then. Memory allocators were a different kind of allocator, and the benchmarks were all about how fast you could allocate the memory, but no one ever deleted it, so it, that was never measured. You just let the process go away, and all of that leaked memory is it's just fine. So it turns out if you actually wanted to be a good citizen and not leak memory, who wants to not leak memory? Anybody here care about memory leaks? Yeah? Okay. Anybody not? Ca camera? Anybody not care about memory leaks? All right. So it, it turned out it took about 10 seconds to get rid of the model. After I provided my fix, uh, does anybody know what Purify is? Anybody old enough to remember Purify? So, so in Purify, it was about 10 seconds to get rid of the model. After that, it didn't show up on Purify at all. Zero time. Now, I don't know if that kind of imp performance improvement is considered useful, but going from 10 seconds to zero, maybe. All right, at Bloomberg, it turns out that around 2002, uh, we realized that this same model that I had developed at Bear Stearns worked very nicely for placing things at a particular location so that they could be what we call save-ranged out to disk and then rehydrated into an identical process bit for bit and just keep running. This is how Bloomberg works. So all you competitors out there, try this. It's nuts. No, seriously, it works. It's something we did. It's a kind of multiprocessing that people do, you know, when you don't have a computer science degree or any knowledge of what's going on, but you need to get something done, which is not uncharacteristic of Bloomberg. People get things done, and they figure out how to do it better later after they've made a gazillion dollars doing it the wrong way. <laughs> All right. Now so then, later in 2006, people who did not like me because I apparently was the big shot that had just written a book and knows something and we can't be bothered with that because we have to get our jobs done. We don't have time to listen to him. Started using allocators in the front end. And the same people that were calling me names said, yeah, he's still one of those, but this is really good because it really speeds up the zippiness of the, of the uh, front end. And now, if I were to say, I was just kidding, give that back to, I would be shot. So these are never going to go away from Bloomberg. Now, these are all anecdotal, and I've told this to people for years and years and years, and I'll get people to come in and say, look, we couldn't do without it. And still, no one believes me. I swear, it's like, nah, you don't have any proof. I need to see proof. Do you know proving stuff isn't for free? Does, has anybody ever tried to prove stuff? So okay, I'm going to go write a benchmark. I'm going to get a million people. They're going to work for a year, and they're going to get another million people. They're going to work for a year, and then we're going to compare the results, and that's going to cost how much? So, no, it doesn't work that way. All right, what are the common arguments against? Well, it requires more upfront effort. Um, complicates the user interface may actually degrade performance. How many people here believe that if I decide I want to take advantage of memory allocators, that in some scenarios, performance could go down? Does anybody believe that? You believe that. You believe that. How many? Well, come on, raise your hands. Be honest. All right. Okay, I would say a quarter to a third. Now, how many people believe here that if allocators are available to use and it goes down in some scenarios, it would also go up in other scenarios. Does anybody believe that? Mm, anybody believe that it won't go up in other scenarios? No. Okay, so we at least have the belief that once we introduce allocators, there might be some cost to, to allowing allocators to be used, but in certain scenarios, it could speed things up. So what's a scenario where using an allocator might slow things down? Does anybody want who's really sure that those scenarios exist? What scenario would it be where an allocator slows something down. Okay, go ahead. Brave man. Uh, say, say, say it into the microphone. When I could have used the stack? When you could have used the stack. Well, if you could have used the stack, why would you use an allocator? 
And I'm serious. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm asking, there is an answer to this question. It's just that the answer is, is not based on reality, but I just want to hear the answer. I'll give it to you if you don't know. So in, in the polymorphic memory allocator model, unlike the C++11 model, the C++17 model, you don't have the option when the allocator is the default allocator to squeeze out that last pointer. You're going to have that pointer in every object that allocates memory. So you say, well, if that's the case, and I don't care about allocators, and I'm always using the default, why on earth would I want to pay that performance penalty for every single thing that everybody does when only a tiny fraction of people really care. So that's something you might be thinking about. And that would be a good argument to, to gin up some fear, uncertainty, and doubt, also known as FUD. But if you try to measure that performance overhead, you'd be in trouble. Just saying. Because it turns out that with a little bit of cleverness, it's not an increase in size in the footprint. It doesn't have to be. So just keep in mind that with a little bit of cleverness, that amount of space also lives in the heap. So when you're not allocating memory, there is no extra memory. When you are allocating memory, you're allocating it on the heap, which is not important at all because of the geometric growth and everything. It works out to be the more you use memory, the less it matters as far as the spatial consideration. So I'm just giving you a hint at the kind of FUD that is being broadcast by people. Another thing you might say is, wait a minute, virtual function. Oh, that means an indirection and all this runtime. That's going to kill any performance that an allocator might have. You might be saying that too. Stay tuned. Okay? I just wanted to give you a little ammunition. If there's no special allocator needed, maybe I choose the wrong allocator. Maybe I just don't know what I'm doing, and I say, I could use an allocator, eeny, meeny. Uh, yeah, I like that. I like the name of that one. I'm going to use that one. Okay, don't, if you're doing that, it's probably not a good idea. So these are all valid concerns, and they can be addressed only with well-supported facts, which I have come armed with, and careful measurement, also come armed with. Main memory, so here's main memory. Here's the CPU. Now, in terms of efficiency, some people have all the time in the world, and so when I started out, I drew this wonderful picture, and I don't know if you can see it, but notice the gradient on the, the arrows. See, notice it's got two shades. That comes from the wear that varies with the points going around. There's more wear on the out, you know, and it, more, I mean, you know, more wear as, it's, as it goes out, it, it sort of blends into the, the scenery there. And I took a lot of time to make that really look cool. And then when I add something, it rotates a little to indicate that time is moving forward. And this is incredibly painful in terms of the amount of time it takes. So as I add, I'm, I'm now using memory and the CPU is kind of clocking as you see and it's going along. And typically uh, memory collects uh, in, in pools nearby. That's, that's that locality thing. Anybody ever heard of locality, right? So that happens naturally. I didn't make it up. And see this thing keeps cranking. So after that, I realized there's no way I'm going to keep doing that. So you saw it there. Just remember, whenever you see this kind of thing happening, that thing is turning, but it's not going to turn anymore. All right. So now we're going to introduce a cache. And the purpose of the cache is to, is to keep the things that are local closer, and by closer I mean more quickly accessible to the computer. I want to mention, by the way, it doesn't matter whether that's L1, L2, L3 doesn't matter what we're talking about. It happens that I modeled it as like it's an L1 cache. Be pages in memory. The idea is that when you're able, what happened? Is this good? Is it still good? Is everybody okay? Video is okay. Sounds okay as well, but live not. I'm not checking that. All right. So anyway, but it doesn't matter. What I'm trying to do is give you a mental model of what's going on. So. Just think of this as some sort of cache. Don't get too involved, because none of the experiments that we did care about what kind of cache it is, and nor did we allow anybody to try to explain things in terms of absolute number of bytes. We observe things. You be the judge as to what the cause is. So we're back here, and now look what's happening. I access memory. Now I get a cache line. You've heard of what a cache line? I hope people have heard of a cache line. What is a cache line? It's a bunch of contiguous things, and it kind of looks like this. It goes to the cache. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just pretend you do, because that's all it is, <laughs> right? Then something else happens over here. We get another cache line, and you can see that it's just an associative memory, but the cache is much faster. Faster is good. 
And then we get access over there. Now notice it happened instantly over here. That's cute, right? Because once you have the cache line in cache, you don't have to go back to memory, it just happens. The details are unimportant. And you keep doing this, and now you're getting much faster processing speeds. Okay? And then you get this green thing, and that's supposed to represent a write. So you have to write the thing back, and it doesn't matter what the details are. The point is, it goes away from cache now, let's say. And then something else comes in, and oh, I can reuse that memory. So the cache is finite, it's small, and I can keep reusing it. So temporal locality causes things to stay in cache, and if you don't have temporal locality, they'll get kicked out for something that's more immediate, more local in time. How am I going? Does this make sense? How many people know everything I just said? Okay, good. Now be honest, how many people learned something from what I just said? Be honest. It's still worth it, because there's the middle region that just won't admit it. All right. Because I learned something from writing this, I got to tell you. Anytime you put something down, you know, it makes it a little crisper. Main memory segments. Now, I bet you most of you who've gone to school know this stuff. So you have a program, and you put it in to memory, right? And now you have a stack that grows down, maybe, and you have dynamic memory that grows up. Look familiar? Still feel like I had to say it. What's a memory allocator? Does anybody know what a memory allocator is? You think, yeah, what is it? It's, a, it's an algorithm to place a memory you allocate. So a memory allocator is an algorithm. Is it? Is it an algorithm? Uh, yes, it's a, it's a, a memory allocator. What is this? Is this an algorithm to change slides? <laughs> okay. So my point is it's not that easy to say what, what these things are, but I'm going to talk about what they are because it's important to be precise. C, mem C, memory, uh, C language memory allocation, what do we have for that? Well, we have this thing called malloc.h that has malloc and free. Are those memory allocators? What do you think? Implementations. Are they implementations? That's a good point. Are they implementations? The Are they interfaces? They're interfaces. They're not implementations. Cool, huh? <laughs> All right. And malloc works on dynamic memory. Did you have a question? No? Then we have these special purpose things. Has anybody ever heard of alloc A? Yes, what's alloc A? It's a what? It's to allocate on the stack. It's to allocate on the stack. All right, I'll buy that. It's not an algorithm, though. <laughs> All right. So it's to allocate on the stack. Good. Cheers. And it refers to a little bit of the stack, not the whole stack, because only part of the stack is relevant at, at any given time, you know, the part that's visible, right, okay. So memory allocator organizes a region of computer memory, dispensing and reclaiming authorized access to suitable subregions on demand. Easy, right? You know that just came off the tip of my tongue the first time I tried to write it. <laughs> no. So, we have general purpose allocators, we have special purpose allocators. I'll let you read what it says on the slide. Intuitively, a general purpose allocator is what you use when you don't know what you're doing. On the other hand, a special allocator, special purpose allocator, is an allocator you use when you do know what you're doing and hopefully you'll use the right one. Okay? Good. Then, we have global allocators. We have local allocators. Global allocators are allocators that are around for all space and time, and I don't have to worry about the allocator going out of scope, and I can access it from anywhere without having to pass in a reference, basically. And a local allocator is not so much. You do have to worry about when the allocator is around, and you have to pass access to it because it's an individual object, it has space and time coordinates. How are we doing? Okay. So, in C++, we have new. So we have C, malloc is an interface in C, and new is an interface in C++. Not an allocator, right? Now, I know most of you knew that, but if somebody asked you the question, would you have been able to phrase it so succinctly? I think not. So what we're learning here is accuracy and precision 
about allocators and what they are. So even if you don't want to admit it, it's happening right in front of you. I know because after writing this talk, I know more about allocators than I did before I started. And I spent months on this. I know. There's stuff here. All right. So I put this nice little picture up. And maybe you could just spend a second while I consume some liquid and see if this makes sense. So malloc and free and new and delete are general and global. So are TC malloc and JE malloc. Has anybody ever heard of those implementations? Are they any good? They're good. They brought you 20%. Is 20% enough? <laughs> Are you happy with 20%? You know, in my book, all right, fine, 20% is pretty good. <laughs> so if you can get 20% improvement on your program and, uh, and your programming and, and, and performance, then you might be able to buy one more million dollar computers. Is that what you're saying? Maybe? Million dollars? I don't know. Oh, yeah, we're not in the US. Million euros? And by the way, we buy big iron. We don't buy these little things. We're going to start buying these little things, but right now we, we buy from IBM and, you know, they're big. <laughs> okay. So at the other end, local and special, alloc A, right? It's not around for a long time, and if you allocate something big, what happens? Blows up your stack. If you forget and... Stack pops and you're still, right? There's issues. Okay. <sighs> All right. So a memory allocator is a stateful utility or mechanism that organizes a region of computer memory dispensing and reclaiming authorized access to suitable subregions on demand. Now we have a local arena and we have over here in the CPU something, some mechanism that gets at that local arena. That little green thing is a memory allocator. Okay, so just take a look at this code. You'll see here I have this local allocator, some local allocator, and uh, you can construct it with something. What would you construct a local allocator with somebody? What would you, what would you give it on construction? Would you default construct it or maybe? You'd give it memory. Yes, who said that? Raise your hand. Excellent, what's your name? Arvid. Say it again. Arvid. Arvid? Arvid's right. It's very good. I'm very impressed. Yes, begin and end. Very well done. So we don't have a default local allocator because that would be silly. It wouldn't have any information to be local. Okay. Now what do we do? The same thing we always did. We allocate memory, we give it back. But we have to let whatever is allocating and getting rid of it know how to get to it, right? Because it's an instance of a type. Right? An allocator, a local allocator, is an instance of a type of local allocators. We could have many local allocators, right, of the same type. Or we could have different types of local allocators, and it turns out we will have different types of local allocators. Okay. So we have this wonderful property on local allocators that you don't need to ask the container or whatever is asking for the memory. It doesn't need to say, give it back. We could just say, as the owner of the whole thing, you're done. So we just, we don't care. The container's been going all of a sudden, we just go, no, nope, it's all over. That may make people somewhat unhappy, except that the person that had 10 seconds go to zero was very happy, because that's what we did. We gave the person a local allocator, and when the person was done, they just forgot about it. And the allocator said, bye-bye and everything went away. And you might say, wait a minute, that can't be legal C++. Something's going wrong here. Who here is willing to bet that that's illegal C++? You? Oh, dear. Okay. The lifetime requires it to go through placement new. This is the statement. So if I were to, for example, allocate memory from a local allocator, and then just forget about it, and then reallocate memory and use it, that would be illegal? Depends on the use case. 
Well, I'm giving you the use case. I allocate a whole bunch of stuff, then I just forget about it. I reset my allocate, and then I allocate a whole bunch of stuff and go to town. I never, I never deallocate it from that. I just go to town. Okay. Um, I think it would be it would be legal as long as you call destructors and constructors uh, properly. Okay. Well, I'm suggesting what if I don't? What if I just construct a whole bunch of stuff up over here? with stuff that doesn't use external resources other than memory, and then forget about it, reuse the memory for something else, and never call the destructors, and never do anything. Is that necessarily illegal C++? Uh, okay, I don't, uh, I don't know that. Okay, you don't know that. So moving on, I will tell you later that it isn't illegal. It is legal if you do it right, and by doing it right, it means once you stop thinking that it's allocated, don't try to use it. That's all it is. It's a mental thing. If you think about allocating it, it's illegal. But if you don't, it's not illegal. <laughs> a memory allocator is the client-facing interface for a stateful utility or mechanism that organizes a region of computer memory, dispensing and reclaiming authorized access to suitable subregions on demand. I'm trying to come up with different flavors of the same thing. But really, a memory allocator is a mechanism. And the, the interface is important because we'll see that there are different ways to do it. We could supply it as stateful utility functions, like malloc and free. But it doesn't support allocator objects, so it's not convenient in the C++ world. We could use a reference wrapper. So I have an object that simply refers to it. So, for example, I have a new delete allocator. And when I say allocate, it calls new. And when I say deallocate, it calls delete. That's an object. It's stateless in some sense. But you can use it in the same way you could use a local allocator. It's nice, and what's nice about it is the allocator type is available for use by the client's compiler. You know what it is, life is good. Forces the client to be a template, though. Now, that's a problem, because from 2004, where it came to me, actually in my downstairs restroom in my house, I remember where I was, and I said, wait a minute, if I use a different allocator, it changes the type of the object. That's no good. That was in 2004. And it's bothered me ever since. It's like, that's no good. Because you don't want the allocator, of all things, to change the interface, let alone the type of the object. But that's what they do. So this is a problem. And this is C++11 allocators. So how about the address of a pure abstract base class? What's wrong with that? Well, can be, I can actually, what's good about it is I can hold on to the allocator. I have it in my hand. This is... My allocator is the base class, and it, I can refer to the allocator as an object. So that's really nice. Really, really nice. And it doesn't affect the C++ type. That's really, really nicer. It's awesome. What's the problem? Well, we have to go through this virtual function interface. Now, what's the worst thing about that? It's not new. It's not fun. It's been around for a long time, and it's boring. And that is literally the worst part about it, because everything else is awesome. <laughs> the object must somehow hold an extra address, even for the default case. That's true. How many people are going to lose sleep over that? To lose sleep over that, you have to find a case. You, who's losing sleep back there? No, yes? Joking or not? Speak loudly. It's a joke. Well, I'm going to try to put some of your, your sleeplessness to rest today, but um, it is true, and yet, you know, what can I say? You know? Ah. All right. What do I need to do? All right. I feel that these are timed a little bit too coincidentally. All right. Does anybody have any questions before I go on to the next thing? How are we doing? Oh, we're actually doing all right. Any questions? Because I'm going to go on to talk about some stuff. I'm going to talk about measurement. No? All right. So when we decide what we're going to do, we have to decide first, do we want to supply an allocator? This is the mental model that we must go through. 
And if the answer is no, we're done. And nothing that I'm going to say in this talk is going to matter to you. Or we could say yes. And then we have to ask the question, okay, am I going to supply it via a base class pointer at construction? Or am I going to invade the type of the object at compile time? So we have to make that decision. But either way we make that decision, because it's the same thing, we're going to have to choose an allocator. So there are two syntactic ways to make this happen. One of them invades the type of the object and makes it not interoperable with other things, unless your client is a template. And the other one is this old-fashioned thing that's boring. You have to decide new and cute or old and boring. Once you make that decision, then you have to choose which allocator you're going to use. You could still use the default allocator, the new delete allocator, which in effect would be what you would have gotten if you didn't do anything, possibly through more interesting interface or more boring interface, depending on how you look at it. But no matter what, then because it's a local allocator, if it's a local allocator, unless it's the default, which isn't a local allocator, then you can decide whether you want to what's called wink out the memory when you're done. Because it's a local allocator, we can do that. We have that choice. We don't have to, but we can. So people who feel like, no, this is, this is just not right. I can't, I can't bring myself to get that kind of performance improvement. <laughs> don't have to. It's still good. But if you are that kind of person that really has no morality at all and just says, heck with it. I want the best performance I can get. You might even stoop to this. No one's going to like you. Promise, except those who are the initiated, but those people will, will love you. All right. Or your customers, they might love you too. And then you have to pick, among all of this, the optimal allocator strategy. That's what you're trying to do. So either don't use allocators or do it right. So this is the decision tree, and if I could tell you how to do this, your code will run faster, especially the code that you want to run faster will run faster. And if, in particular circumstances, the amount that it will run faster will boggle your mind. So I will proceed. So we have a bunch of strategies. One of them, we have a global allocator, and we can pass it as a type parameter or as an abstract base class. So for the global, we have two strategies. Then for the local, we have monotonic, multipool, and I borrowed the template notation because I love templates so much. Multipool of monotonic. By the way, I'm being facetious. I am known for not liking templates, and that's just not true. I am known for not liking templates when they're not appropriate, and that's true. Templates are awesome, used appropriately. Really awesome. And in fact, concepts are all about using templates appropriately. And if we had a constrained auto, plug for constrained auto, I would use it. But that's another talk. <laughs> So we have monotonic multipool and multi-tool pool of monotonic, which means that I'm using the multipool as the front end, but it's backed by a monotonic. You probably say, what's that? We'll get there. But just accept that there are three. And we can call them either via, I mean, we can invoke them, we can install them. What do I want to say? Imbue your object with them, either by type parameter or as the pointer to an abstract base class of construction. Those are your options. The first one is C++11, the second one is C++17. Wait a minute. This is old fashioned. How come we have that C++17? Remember what I said? The worst thing about it is it's old fashioned. It's not interesting. Well, now that it's part of C++17, it just became in vogue again. So you can be cool by using an abstract base class and an allocator. Well, whoa, I'm hip. Isn't that funny? You know, just because something's old doesn't mean it's bad. I'm 58 years old. <laughs> and getting better. All right. Normal destruction or magically winked out. That's another option we have. So look at this. 3 times 2 times 2 is 12. 2 and 12 is 14. I have 14 allocation strategies I can choose from. Yes, sir. What do we mean by winked out? Do you remember the discussion we had pri previously when I said, what if I don't call the destructor? I just say, forgot about it. I'm over here now. Okay. All right, so here they are. We need to go over these. 
because if you're going to get your money's worth, you have to know what they are. The good news is there's a lot of repetition, which I'm going to elide, but in the beginning, there's going to be a lot of detail. So let's start with the detail. Here's AS1, and it's the default global allocator. So my allocation strategy relies on the default global allocator, and this is the standard allocator. Okay, and it has allocate and deallocate, and notice that it just invokes those. Okay. This is AS1. This is via type parameter. Now, the interesting thing is, I can do it like this, or I can do it like this. The compiler on both Clang and GCC will generate the same code, so we're not going to consider both. We're going to consider them to be the same. So both of these are the same. But we could also do it in normal destruction because it's a, it's a global allocator. We have no choice. So here's what happens. We have a vector. We're going to create a system. We're going to go through the old style, C++03 style, because I'm old. Remember that. And for those people that don't know C++11, how many people here have companies where you're not yet able to use C++11? Honest. Okay, you work at larger companies. Places like Google, Facebook, Bloomberg, Microsoft, et cetera, et cetera, have issues with the hardware people who are trying to catch up. And so there are many, not even as large as Bloomberg, that don't yet use C++11. So that's why, in part, that I'm doing it this way. But anyway, I would argue that C++11 is a great thing but it doesn't mean that C++03 is useless. I just want to make it clear. C++03 is also a great thing. It doesn't support allocators, but it's a great thing. All right. We do our benchmark, and then we get rid of stuff the normal way. We go through and we delete it. This is normal stuff. This is stuff that pretty much anybody can do. All right. Now, notice I just changed it to auto. Auto is kind of strange. I have to write a paper for Bloomberg that explains what you should just use and not worry about, what you shouldn't use and not worry about, and what you might want to use and worry about. And auto is at the top of the list of what you might want to use and worry about. One of them has a reference. One of them doesn't have a reference. Who knows? But I'm telling you, there are people that say almost always auto, and they're almost always wrong in my opinion, almost always. There are places to use auto, but if you're using it because you don't have a reason not to, you should read the paper that I'm going to write for Bloomberg because there are reasons not to and they have to do with making unexpected copies, obfuscating, having funny things behave differently because you used auto and made the copy. Another talk. All right. So, AS2, new delete allocator. This is the same thing but through an abstract base class. So here's a protocol. A protocol is a pure abstract base class. It's my name for it. So when I say protocol, what I mean is it's a pure abstract base class, and the destructor is defined empty in the .cpp file, so it's not pure. The reason for that is back a long time ago, if you didn't define the first uh, virtual function out of line, the compiler wouldn't know where to put the vtable and would put it in every translation unit statically. And then what would happen is instead of today where the linker sorts it out, you would get 8,000 copies of a vtable in every translation unit and your code would blow up. That was a long time ago. That is not the problem now. Now we do that because that's how templates work. You know, you get in everything that uses it and it's, the linker sorts it out. But because of that, that's why we define it out of line. All right. You still have the two methods here. They're abstract. Here we have the new delete allocator derived from the public allocator. It's a concrete type. Does anybody know about inheritance, or have you just completely forgotten? <laughs> Do I have to explain it? You forgot? No? You're good? Okay, good. All right. So, you get the idea here, right? This is a, it's going to call this stuff. I put it in line. There's something wrong. Who here is such a wizard at compiling? They see there's a syntax error here. There's a syntax error up here. Does anybody see it? Inline. Who said inline? You said inline. So what's wrong? Okay, 
Okay, so I, this is wrong. What you said, this is wrong because you can't inline a virtual function. Is that correct? It's how I just did. <laughs> how difficult is it? Well, are you a compiler writer? Okay, hint to self, no. You can inline a virtual function, of course you can. What does the compiler need to know in order to inline a virtual function? Does anybody know? You need to know the concrete type. What if you knew the concrete type as a compiler? Suppose you could figure it out. Then could you inline it? Okay, can you think of any circumstance where you might know the concrete type? What if the concrete type is created, is the, the object of the concrete is created, the line before it's used? Like, concrete object, blah. Use blah through its abstract interface. You're the compiler, you're looking at it. It's right there on the page. Any sentient being would know, that, this, that's it. <laughs> well, it depends. So Clang isn't sentient, but GCC is a little bit more sentient. And GCC is sentient enough to do that for you pretty much all the time when it can see the code. And if you think about, say, a map, so I create an allocator and then I create a map. I pass the address of the allocator into the map via its abstract base class. And the compiler goes, huh. And then it writes the same code as it would have if it had invaded the type. Who knew? Now that Clang knows this is part of C17 and GCC is already ahead of the game, I suspect Clang, I know Chandler. <laughs> he will not stand for it. All right. So, yes, these are, these are actually in line, not because, not be, this is actually illegal. I'm not allowed to say in line and then in line it. I have to choose one or the other. So I can say inline and then put the definition elsewhere, or I can not inline and do this. The point of the red here is to just call attention to it, really. So it's a syntax error, but it's intentional. They're inline, and that's important. So the compiler can see it. So the compiler can devirtualize when it can. There's no reason not to. Okay. All right, so. Notice what we're doing, we're creating an allocator and then we're passing in the address. And this is, this can be bounded compile time sometimes. 15 minutes, got it. All right, well, I'm gonna have to speed up then. Let me move it along. We have normal destruction uh, here. So this is an example of what it looks like in C++17. This is a polymorphic memory resource list. And again, I'll just go through this really quickly because it's more of the same kind of thing. We do the benchmark, okay, and this is normal destruction. Now, we're gonna go to a new kind of allocator. What is the new kind of allocator? Monotonic. Monotonic is a local allocator. It, it, you create a buffer. Typically, the buffer's on the stack, which makes it fast, kind of like alloc A, and Monotonic allocator is it never deletes anything, it just allocates. So if you need a char, it allocates a char. And then because of natural alignment, a char can go anywhere, so you put it next to it, and then another char, and it goes next to it. Now we have a short. Short can't go anywhere, it has to go on a two byte boundary. So it has to go there. And now we have an int, and an int can't go anywhere, it has to go on a four byte boundary. So it goes there. And now we have a short, and that certainly can go right next to it. Now we have a char, and that can go next to it. Now we have an int. That has to go there because it has to be in a four byte boundary. How many people know about natural alignment? Okay, if you don't, you do now. <laughs> you can't put something unless the, 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 the address of the object is divisible by its size for fundamental types. Natural alignment, okay. So then, this is where I can put this thing down. What this is doing is it's once I exceed the memory that's available on the stack, it just goes to dynamic geometric growth and allocates off those blocks. Door, please. Note that if you deallocate, it's a no op. So if it's a type parameter, normal destruction, what happens? Well, we have this, this wrapper thing, and basically what I'm doing in the type system is I'm just creating an object that holds a pointer. So it's really not a value type but we make it look like one. That's what the standard does. And of course, the standard is completely wrong. Uh, can also supply a buffer on the stack, yes. 
Uh, so here we're doing it the, nor the old way. Now, I broke this out into two pieces. First, we're going to destroy the element, and then we're going to deallocate it. Okay? So that's two things. Now, we're going to go and magically wink it out. What does that look like? See this deallocate? When eight goes out of scope, all the memory is going to go away anyway, so I don't need that. So I can just take that out. How many people are okay with that? Because the memory's going away anyway. I still called the destructor, I just didn't get rid of the memory. And then all the memory's going away. Good? Good? Anybody upset? Do you have a question or you're, you're good? All good. Okay, but now, what if I do this? Magically wink it out. Does anybody get upset if I just don't do anything? Because when the allocator goes away, all that memory's going away anyway. And the only thing that's going away is memory. There's no resource. Since I know that, yes... The memory for them is given back. Sure, but if you do something okay, if you do something like what? Other resources. So other resources. So if you had other resources, you would put them in the documentation. This thing manages a file handle. If that were the case, would you actually do this? No. No, you wouldn't do that. You know, if you were, you were shooting at a target and there was a guy walking by right when you were about to pull the trigger, would you pull the trigger anyway? Are you that kind of guy? <laughs> All right. This isn't Texas, you know. So we wouldn't do that. We would know not to do that. In fact, because we're good citizens, we just wouldn't do that. If we were writing something that managed a non-memory resource, if we were good citizens, we'd let our client know that, wouldn't we? Can you imagine writing an object that managed a non-memory resource and keeping it a secret? That would be wrong. Those are the kind of arguments that I have trouble taking seriously as an engineer because, sure, if somebody's a lunatic, then you're right. But then why hire them? Okay. So this is legal C++. We can do this. And because I'm low on time, I'm going to go through a little bit quicker. It's the same idea. The important one to realize is multipool is different from monotonic. Monotonic is a special purpose allocator, right? Very specific, it doesn't delete. So if you use monotonic, you could use a ball of memory if you're not careful, right? You just alloc, 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 dealloc, nothing, alloc, alloc, dealloc, nothing. You run out of memory, not good. So the multipool is a much more general purpose thing. And as I'm going along in my long running process, I'm allocating things of a given size and then using them up. And you'll notice there's sort of a geometric growth as to how much I allocate. Now, in this model, this was written before we figured out a better way to write. So we don't need to saturate. You'll notice it saturates at some point at some like 32, but you don't need to anymore because what this was doing is was sewing the links together. That worked very well, but it's much more aesthetic to not sew the links together and hold two pointers, and now it can grow geometrically indefinitely, and there's no penalty for doing it. Anyway, so that's what a multipool allocator looks like. Basically, it's designed to be able to run indefinitely, and when you delete something, it goes back to the free list. That's the idea. If it exceeds the maximum size, and this is important, it's just a pass-through. So all of these things are oversized objects, and they just go through as if it didn't exist. So it's an intermediary for handling small to mid-sized objects, but not huge objects. You allocate a megabyte, it goes straight through. Do you understand what the difference is? Here, it's not a no-op to... Un un to delete something. It's not a no-op. It actually goes back. So you can use this indefinitely, provided you don't legitimately run out of memory. All right, now, it's really very similar uh, with the winking out, so I'm not going to go through that same idea. And then the combination is just the two together. And again, it's very similar, but you're cascading them. So when the Multipool runs out of memory, it goes to the monotonic. The monotonic doesn't give back, but the nice thing is the multipool is acting as the front end. So if anybody knows about analog versus digital circuits, right? Analog circuits have the front end, the leading edge, and you do the, 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 uh, what is it, the analysis, the small signal analysis at that point. That's kind of like, probably lost on a few of you, but anyway, it's kind of like what a multipool is. It's handling the small signal stuff, but the big signal stuff is handled behind. So the DC voltage and then the AC voltage. Whatever. All right. Finally got to use some of my EE background. So we're going to try to understand the parameters of 
like what we're interested in. So we have number of instructions and uh, number of active workers, and note that these parameters are deliberately chosen to, per to, to be performed independently. What aspects of software affect optimal memory allocation? So what we're doing here is we're setting up for the benchmarks that we're going to look at. So D is for density of allocation operations. V is for variation of allocated sizes. Locality is that of accessed memory. Uh, utilization of deallocated memory, of allocated memory, I'm sorry, and contention of concurrent allocations. So these are five dimensions. How did we come up with these? We worked a long time to try to come up with something to characterize an application or scenario that we could talk about and have a vocabulary, because vocabulary is important when you're trying to talk to people. And, you know, what we do in my group is not so much writing code, but we try to figure out how we're going to explain to the world how to explain to the world what we're doing. You know, it's kind of tough. Because it's, we do some stuff here. So, um, so this is the stuff that we do. So these dimensions are intended to be rough indications. Uh, we could map them onto zero or one, where zero is not so much, and one is pretty much. And uh, that's what I just said here. The dimensions are far from independent. It's very hard to come up with the dimensions that's truly orthogonal with another. And obviously contention is going to be very much tied to allocation and deallocation density. Right? Okay. So here's density. I'm going to put it up, but because I'm short on time, I think you get the idea. We're saying how much of the code is all about allocating and deallocating memory. If I do one allocation in my long-running program, do I really care about allocators? Interesting. Do I? Not for, not for the normal reason, but maybe that has to go somewhere. Maybe that has to be over here. If that's the case, yes, otherwise no. So, zero is we don't allocate any memory. Who cares? And one is every single instruction is allocate or deallocate. Okay? Think about popping, populating a vector of int using pushback. Does that have a high or a low allocation density? Somebody tell me. High or low? Okay, who says high? Raise your hands. You say it's high. So I, 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 let's say I, I push back a billion integers. What percentage of those are allocation instructions? It, is it high or low? Low. Okay. What if I happen to up front reserve a billion then it's one allocation, so it's low, okay? All right, variation in allocated sizes. So if they're all the same size, there's no variation, and if everyone is different, there's a lot of variation. You get the idea. Locality, this is a tough one, because you have spatial locality, and you have temporal locality. Now, it's easy for me to talk about, because I've been living this for a long time, but if you hear this at first, what's the difference? I can understand that I was there, but there's a difference. So this is not an equation. This is a way of modeling something in your head. The more instructions that pass through a block of memory per unit time, the more hits you're getting, the better for locality. Now, if you look at just the physical part, the smaller the memory, the higher the hit density is. Right? If I have a big memory, yeah, I'm going into memory, but if it's all of memory, what do I care? That's nothing. So that makes it a very small locality if memory is all of memory. But if memory is really small, it's like putting a laser with a magnifying glass and really good. On the other hand, if T is the number of times I jump out of this block during this thing, right? If I don't jump out at all, I'm hammering it, right? But if every time I hammer it, I jump out, I'm not hammering it anymore. So if your transitions are a lot. If you're jumping out a lot, your locality goes down. So it's proportional to the number of instructions that you're talking about divided by the amount of memory that you have in your cache or in your, in your, in your block to fit in the cache and divided by the number of times you jump away before you come back. Again, this is not an equation. This is a mental model. It's a zeroth order approximation, but it gives you an idea. That's all I'm trying to do. Clear? Okay. You get the idea. That's what I just said. I'm putting it up. I'm not going to repeat it. All right. Believe it or not, locality 
is more important than anything else by far. It's the most important thing. And it has nothing to do with how many times you malloc and free. It has to do with where the memory is relative to how your system works. And this is something that people don't consider, and that's why they make statements that are absolutely foolish. This is the most important thing. It's not that other things aren't important, but this is the most important thing. I want you to just suck that in. Okay, utilization. Utilization is what fraction of memory do I have in core in process at a given time. I might allocate a trillion bytes, but if I do it all at once, that's a high utilization and I'll run out of memory. But if I allocate it 5K time and give it back, 5K give it back, and I wind up allocating a trillion bytes, I could have a tiny little memory and it would still work. Right? So, that's what I just said. And then, I was just having you think about it. Assume strings are long. People know about the small string optimization. In the benchmarks, we're going to talk about it. It looks like we're going to talk about benchmarks entirely next, next session because we're going to run out of time in about two minutes or one minute or something, maybe zero minutes. I'm going to finish this. When I stop this, and we'll take a break and then whatever. But let me finish this because we're almost done with this. And then contention. And this really isn't a general test. And I will tell you, of all the things that we were testing, contention is the one we tested the least rigorously. And the reason for that is we know without the contention everything we need to know. And we also know because we're intelligent people that if you know more than what can be known by just seeing instructions come in, then you can do better with contention than you could if you didn't. It's more information. The more information comes from being the architect of the program, and when you're the architect of the program, you can take advantage that you do know more, and know even more, and do even better, if that makes sense. So what we're telling you is when you know this, as a human being, it's completely unfair to any program, because you have global knowledge, plus you designed the game yourself, of course you're gonna win, of course you are. So we didn't try to prove that beyond a shadow of a doubt, we proved it, enough. But anyway, we're just doing it because it's one of the things we thought was worth talking about. So remember, we're characterizing scenarios, and to remember this, we needed, we needed a mascot. We needed a mnemonic. And so, the mnemonic is Divlock, and the mascot is the duck. Divlock the duck. I can't remember it without that. All right, so I'm going to stop here. You guys take a break. And then if you want to see actual benchmarks, you have to come back for the next session. Little tease.